Thomas Pagi, welcome and thank you all for coming back this morning. Um, I think that uh, someone in the audience took a photograph of my socks yesterday that were <coughs> an interesting colour and it's gone a little bit viral, so I've uh, got some uh, little more conservative socks on this morning. Thank you, <laughs> um, I, I wanted to, to thank all of you in the audience for your participation in the working groups yesterday. I walked around. There was robust discussion. Um, there was creative tension at times, and I think that's a good thing when you're solving difficult problems. So thank you indeed for the inputs that all of you contributed uh, throughout the course of yesterday afternoon. Um, we're going to get straight into a feedback session from those working groups. Uh, on stage with me here today, we have Puck Pitrian, uh, Country Director IDH, uh, Stephen Rudgard, who actually wasn't supposed to be on the panel. Someone else has, uh, at the last moment, been not able to attend. So I thank you, Stephen, um, at the very last minute for stepping in to, to assist. Uh, Sridhar, uh, on my right here, is the Senior Safety Officer and Nutrition Officer with FAO in Bangkok. And, of course, welcome back to Dr. Regina, uh, who is our resident nutrition expert on the panel. So we have around 25 minutes, and the purpose of this panel is really to sum up what happened yesterday in the working group. So an executive summary of sorts, um, some feedback, uh, good, bad, otherwise, to the audience. Um, I may have a few questions, you may have a few questions of each other, and then I'd like to give at least five minutes at the conclusion of the panel for the audience to ask some questions as well. So without... Uh, Further ado, I think we'll start with Puck Pitrian, if that's okay, and to give your perspectives on the discussion from yesterday afternoon. Puck. Thank you, Tony. Uh, good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, Selamat pagi. Uh, I was so delighted to facilitate the discussion yesterday. Uh, it was not only because uh, this is close to my heart, rice, like I think you mentioned yesterday that. You ate a lot of rice, yeah? Or uh, this morning? Uh, brown rice as well. Oh, brown rice. <laughs> yeah, um, uh, yesterday we had uh, three uh, interesting but also uh, encouraging uh, sharing uh, from uh, three uh, distinguished panelists. Uh, one from ECO, the second one uh, from Corteva, and the third one from uh, Syngenta Foundation. Uh, what I've uh, taken notes, um, and uh, as a summary, I could uh, share here uh, the fact that uh, they're focusing or they, what they're sharing uh, uh, so far, they, they agreed that uh, when it comes to sustainable rice or staple food crops, uh, the first one uh, we need to do is uh, to improve farmer productivity and then couple with the, the creation of market. Uh, without this kind of farmer productivities and the creation of market, there won't be any profitability. And if there's no profitability, there won't any business cases to support uh, the sustainable uh, staple uh, food crops uh, in the future. And it's not going to be easy to invite financiers or uh, financial institutions to come and also to provide support later on. Uh, what also, uh, in my view, uh, quite interesting uh, is the fact that uh, the three uh, panelists and also one from Olam um, mentions uh, quite significantly uh, the importance of uh, the, the government. Uh, to some degree uh, or to different degrees, uh, different notions about the role of the government, but the government role is important because in the context of uh, uh, staple of food crops, uh, especially rice, uh, it's quite politicized. Uh, so you need to get the government involvement uh, since the get-go. Uh, for instance, uh, addressing the issues of uh, targeted subsidy, for instance. Uh, if you created a, an incentive that's supposed to be an incentive, but then creating different type of result that you don't want to see, it would create uh, difficulties for farmers as well as uh, any business cases to come to this uh, value change. Uh, Links, uh, I mean, this kind of things also link to uh, different type of uh, policies, uh, issues of policy corrections or policy discussion 
that uh, needs to be uh, addressed, uh, linking to fertilizer, linking to many different things, uh, land legality and, and whatnot. Uh, another component that I also uh, saw or uh, took note as a very important uh, and interesting uh, point uh, coming up in the discussion is the involvement of insurance. Uh, and I think uh, the gentleman, Pak Teddy from uh, Syngenta Foundation, mentions that uh, yes, we need to provide uh, access to finance uh, to farmers or individual farmers or uh, cooperatives or uh, different type of farmers organization, but uh, without uh, the support from uh, the insurance, for instance, it would be uh, difficult to help farmers to have this kind of security uh, and also sustainability uh, of financing. So I think this is quite uh, interesting in my view. But of course, this is at still uh, done uh, at the initial stage. So we have to see whether the model that uh, uh, is being tested uh, would uh, lead to a good result. Uh, there are two other things that I uh, also uh, took notes. Uh, one uh, is quite uh, interesting from, I think, the two ladies uh, 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 presenting uh, in our group, uh, Ibu Ruth from ICO and also Ibu Farah, the role of women, or the role of women. And, and in fact, uh, they, they have seen, or they have shown that uh, if you got uh, good woman entrepreneurship, uh, su support it, promote it, and even scale it up, it's not only about productivity that you can get, but also uh, the scale of the business, uh, and uh, attracting more and more farmers to uh, be part of this sustainable value change because uh, women uh, has uh, uh, additional uh, type of contributions uh, in this value change. We all know that women are more organized. <laughs> yeah, I, I, yeah, I can't agree more. <laughs> uh, uh, last but not least, uh, it's, uh, what I also um, uh, observe uh, from the discussions, it's about youth. I think this morning, uh, in a different discussions, we also talk about the role of the youth. Yeah. There are plenty of farmers that have uh, reached to the level of aging farmers. And when we, we talk about rejuvenations uh, in many different commodities, not only about re rejuvenations uh, for the crops, but also re rejuvenation for the farmers. I mean, Absolutely. if you don't have a younger generation to get involved uh, to farmers uh, or farming practices, uh, I think uh, the results uh, in the future will be disastrous, not only for farmers themselves, but also for the rest of the society. Yeah. So those are the notes uh, that uh, I took, and I hope uh, this could cover. But of course, uh, I would allow uh, Patedi, Ibu Fara, uh, Ibu Rud, and uh, Pa Ong uh, mm. to come to you know the discussion if uh, I miss a uh, very important uh, points uh, from uh, yesterday's discussion. Thank you. No, I think that was a wonderful summary. And, and, and for me, at least, the two big issues were, were the economic viability of farming. I mean, we've got some students in the audience. Put your hand up if you'd like to become a rice farmer. Are there any rice farmers in the audience? So that there's a reason for that. And this is a problem that needs to be addressed. And uh, you know, the ageing workforce, I mean, I, I come from a fifth generation wheat farm in arid territory in Australia, which is no longer arable. Um, my father, who retired recently at the age of, of 74, uh, none of the three boys, myself being the oldest, followed on for the mm. same reason. And this is a fundamental challenge. I mean, if we're going to feed a population of 11 billion, uh, we need to figure this one out. So thanks for raising that, indeed. Um, are there any some of the fe fellow panelists that you mentioned would like to add to that, or are there any questions from the audience to Puck Fitri? We can take that now until we perhaps move on to the next panelist. Okay, I'm gonna do it in this order, just so I give you a little bit of a heads up, although Stephen, your heads up is now, you're next. <laughs> <laughs> so, that was approximately three seconds. Um, and then uh, Sweetheart, we'll go with you. Normally it's ladies first, but we'll leave uh, Regina to sort of the end of the panel. So, uh, Stephen, I'm, I'm highly aware that you weren't involved in the discussion, but with your 
breadth of knowledge and wisdom um, working in the, in the broader sort of agricultural industry over the years, I'm sure that you can bring some uh, wise comments to the, uh, to the audience. Assalamu alaikum. Salamat Bagi, and I was actually in the room for three quarters of an hour. Okay, um, okay. I take that back. Now. The only reason, the only reason I had to leave, was that I had to go to the Australian embassy to talk to twenty agricultural councillors from different embassies in Jakarta about commodities. So I prepared some notes for that, and I was interested to see that my notes were basically. And Ross Jacks, who was one of the resource people in the session yesterday. Uh, he's just finished a report on commodities for us, and many of the points that I talked about to the Australian Embassy gathering actually came up in the session. Can I just, just interject there? Which session were you involved with? I, I don't think we mentioned that. The state crops. Okay. okay. Thanks. So um, I heard two of the presentations. I had th I know I heard three of them, actually. Um, I didn't stay for all of the conversation, but I have the notes from it, and it's really bringing together... The key challenge in, in commodities, there are several key challenges in, in commodities in this country. Um, there's that triangle of economic development, environmental sustainability, and societal involvement. And the bad press is all coming around Old Palm, which is, was one of the three commodities that was uh, dealt with yesterday. Cocoa and coffee were also on the table. and. Um, in fact, I made the comment <clears throat> that actually cocoa and coffee just as much engines of deforestation as all palmers, but it doesn't get the international press. People like to drink coffee and eat chocolate, so somehow it's not got the, 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 the negative stigma that, that all palm has. Um, the big challenge for more so in a way for coffee and cocoa, which are traditionally in this country grown much more by smallholders. Old palm is a mix, 40% only uh, of, of the old palm areas grown by smallholders. But they're the vulnerable end. The, the value chains are not very well organized for, for smallholders. Um, they tend to have now older plantations which have declining yields bad pest and disease incidents, for, certainly for cocoa and coffee. Um, their problem is also that they have very low purchasing power, generally right now because the commodity prices are through the floor. Um, all palm oil is, is in, in surplus globally. There are mills even turning away palm, fresh palm uh, um, uh, fruit bunches. So there is, there is something of a crisis uh, around the the purchasing end of the value chain, which is feeding back, of course, to the smallholders. Most of these crops, the land tenure is weak or non-existent, which means there's no surety of, of ownership of land. And that feeds back into the inability to raise money, because if you don't have title, you can't put up the land as a collateral for, particularly if you want to access the CPO, the, the, the group um, palm oil um, fund here, you need to have title. So smallholders are, are facing that declining yield issue, but no real ability to invest. Um, their competitiveness globally is, is, is undermined, and in many cases, they're dealing with the worst possible plant material that they, would, they were buying off the back end of whatever they could get, or being given it by government extension workers, and the big plantations have got the top end. So the yield potential, even when they started, was wildly different. And if they're going to replant, if they're not replant, the one thing you can do with a, with a com commodity crop, a perennial commodity crop, is improve the germplasm. If you don't do that, you're lost. Because then your, your basic material for the next 20 years is essentially underproducing. So everybody understands that. And the ability of, of moving, therefore, to a more lucrative model, which potentially it should be. Per hectare, you're going to get much more potential profit out of a commodity than you would out of rice. Certification is all over the sector. We have the ISPO in palm oil, but we have things like fair trade for coffee and, and, and cocoa. Um, 
The problem is, although people sort of understand the value of it, it's actually a big cost to the farmer to engage, especially the full small farmer. And what's the financial payback to small farmers? Often little or nothing. Because the margin they're going to get, sometimes on fair trade it's, it's better, but the ISPO standard in palm oil isn't bringing a single uh, rupee in extra price. So looking at that, you've got a big burden on the grower to certify and not a lot coming back. So they understand more or less, and of course ISPO is not uh, definitive, it's not um, required. I'm having discussions with government that it should be, but if you're going to do that, then you have to provide all the supporting structures, especially for small farmers who have trouble certifying. Um, and you know the, the voluntary standards that could parallel that, again, there's, there's no, they're often private sector driven and there's no public sector buy-in on those. So one option for small farmers, which was discussed in the session yesterday, is to diversify. But if you've only got one or two hectares, diversification becomes a little bit of a challenge. Because you don't have a lot of land to plant other things on. And if you're going to renew your plantation, it's all gone, and then you've got nothing, no yield coming in for four years waiting for production to start. So that, that, that gap is a serious problem for, for most small farmers, which is why there's a threat to deforestation. They will just walk away from their plantation. And they'll go and plant, they'll go and potentially cut more forest and plant there. So, you know, you can drive in central Sumatra past plantations with palm trees that are so tall they can't harvest them. They've just walked away. They haven't cut the trees down, they've just walked away. Now, that is the challenge that all of us that have any involvement in the sector understand. To renew the plantations will avoid more deforestation. So sustainability has to be about renewal. And the question is, how are we going to do that? The Inti Plasma, anyone who's not Indonesia won't understand Inti Plasma, but it's like an outgrower network. That binds in some smallholders to a central mill or processor or off-taker that then guarantees to buy the product, more or less. The contract forms a bit dubious in, in certain cases. But it does give then an, a network of support that could be leveraged to finance that replanting process. But that, again, is primarily private sector driven. The government sort of stands back. And the government, I think this is a challenge which we'll be taking up from FAO's side to work with the coordinating Ministry of Economic Affairs, but also Ministry of Agriculture, to provide that policy support and the local government involvement that will underpin Um, those commodity clusters are also important for innovation. If farmers can talk to each other and access new technologies, they can do so as a group, which is lowering the entry threshold. So we've got, I think, some really potentially productive ways forward, but it does need strong institutional uh, buy-in at national level. And that's something which the government has been somehow a little bit anxious to not step in because they stay, they, they're over, overawed, I think, maybe, by the big plantation companies in oil palm. But that's not the case in cocoa and coffee, where the predominance is in smallholders. So I would say that, that um, what came out yesterday is, is, was a good sharing of, of what are the established constraints and maybe pointing towards some, some solutions of how to take commodity crops forward. Um, I think it needs a bit more connection between the private sector. Where we are talking to institutions like Rabobank, bringing in the financing sector. Um, they want to uh, reduce risk because financiers are not interested in, in, in high risk. Um, and that smallholder image presents risk. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, it's complex, and we don't have any representatives from the ministry here this morning, but if we did have the Minister for Agriculture sitting here in front of us and you got to ask one question, one, you, you, you had the ability to, to get this individual to do one thing, what would that be from a policy perspective? 
I think it's got to be around certification, but the government has to support that certification process. And how is that going to happen? Because the coordinating ministry doesn't have a network on the ground. They can do the overarching context at Jakarta level, but they don't have staff and operators at the district and province level. That's the Ministry of Agriculture and the Ministry of Trade and, uh, and Commerce. So we need that multi-sectoral buy-in, and can the Ministry of Agriculture leverage that? Because they have a key position. Yeah, yeah it's a challenge when the coordinating ministry is not coordinated as such. Well, it so. doesn't have the resources on the ground. Yeah, yeah, yeah. OK. Are there any questions that you'd like to address to Stephen? Otherwise, we'll move on to Sridhar, if you'd like to introduce the, uh, the panel that you are moderating, facilitating, mm -hmm. give your feedback from the, uh, the working group. Thanks, Sridhar. Thanks, Tony, and good morning, everyone. So we had a very engaging uh, panel yesterday, which had speakers all actually from the private sector. So uh, whereas the session was actually titled to be on animal protein, which includes livestock, poultry, fish, and other sources, but it actually turned out to be a much more engaging discussion on partnership to achieve our aims to increase uh, protein content in diets. And during the process of discussion, we actually touched on many other SDGs uh, apart from SDG 2, so SDG 17 partnership, 14 on 15, which is life on land and life on the water, as well as 12, which is sustainable production consumption. So we had uh, four very engaging speakers. Uh, they were Juzi from the Charwen Popcom Group, uh, Adik from Udilever, uh, Kunagung from um, Cargill, as well as a fourth uh, um, uh, Dayu from uh, Great Giant Livestock, who didn't actually give a presentation, but she joined the panel a little later. So let me start with what actually happened at the end. So we had a um, very curious question from one of our young members in the audience who actually asked uh, the panelists that now that you all have expressed um, your enthusiasm and all the ideas that you've got in place to help achieve SDG2 as well as other SDGs, what is actually stopping you from cooperating closer or collaborating among yourselves or acting as you know, as a force multiplier. So one of the things that I pointed out was, um, and which uh, for me as well, this is the first time that I'm attending an event where the organizer is United Nations. Mm -hmm. As in United Nations representing all 17 agencies, and of course there are other agencies as well. Because most of the time it's either FAO or WFP or WHO, one of the, you know, so, and UNICEF and so on. But uh, so the point being made was if the UN can start getting its act together, there really shouldn't be a problem with all the other sectors trying to get the same thing uh, in some way or the other. Is that a fair comment? No. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? I mean, it's, it's, it's an aspirational comment. Let's okay. say. So uh, one of the key points that actually came about through that session was, um, as our uh, you know, uh, illustrious speakers actually said, that SDG is actually has made the, us a little more disciplined in our approach, it actually puts a very good frame into which both the government, the UN agencies, the private sector, the consumers, the civil society, everybody is able to work within that frame to achieve or look towards achieving the target. So some of the key things that were identified uh, during the discussion were, one was all the companies described their uh, corporate social responsibility initiatives. And there were a few, a few interesting points which came about. One, they're all quite heavily focused on nutrition. So increasing, uh, making available nutrition for school children through distribution of eggs, for example, or by actually co contributing to sustainable lives and sustainable agriculture for farmers to increase their incomes, therefore they're able to buy better food for themselves. And similarly, so there were all these initiatives which provide the ground for them to actually launch an initiative together. In other words, there's a lot of common ground where these companies can actually join forces and say, let's work with the government of Indonesia to, uh, to increase the amount of protein that can be avail made available to school children or to children in general so that they have better access and we can eventually, uh, over a period of time, reduce the rate of stunting. 
So these are the second issue was on food loss and waste. Now one of the things which was again came about in the discussion was that um, livestock is uh, known or has been analyzed as being contributing to 15 to 18 percent of greenhouse gas emissions on the total uh, global total. Now what do we do to reduce them? Now there are no simple solutions. We cannot. It's not advice or workable simply to say let's stop eating meat or let's stop growing meat or growing uh, po or having poultry. So an easier solution could be to reduce food, less and food loss and waste because almost a gigaton of fixed carbon is lost because of food losses. And therefore, it's a, it's a different way of actually reducing emissions from the livestock sector. So that's another place where they can join forces. forces and the, the point was expressed that here's where the UN and all its agencies can be an honest broker between the private sector and the government because there is a lot of a uh, lot of issues that come in when uh, the private sector wants to explore these kind of partnerships. The other area which was looked at was on capacity building, particularly in all these chains we are talking about, the value chains, the supply chains. And these go beyond the livestock sector, they also go into the crop sector and horticulture and so on. Now, we had, there was a, a word which often came about very commonly was on smallholders. So almost all the companies are working with smallholders, helping them to have a more sustainable livelihood, to have improved methods of farming, reduce use of agrochemicals, inputs such as organic and so on. So now again, these were all piecemeal. They were all uh, being targeted at, let's say, a few thousands of farmers. But we know that these numbers are in the millions. And if you look at these <coughs> sites, in the hundreds of millions. So here's an opportunity again for the companies to collaborate and say develop an entire workforce or an entire army of sustainable farmers. Focus on codes of practice, uh, good practices, or packages which every farmer or smallholder in a sector can be trained in or be sensitized to. It still allows them to keep their competitive space so they don't have to compromise on what they're producing and how they want to sell in the market. They still keep that. But now they have an entire base, a solid agriculture base from which they can work off them. So these were the other things that actually came out. And here we again, we mentioned, it was important to mention that this right now from 2019 to 2099, and then also around the same period, we have the UN decade for family farming. We also have the UN decade for agroecology. So these are two instruments, advocacy instruments that can be taken advantage of. And finally, one important point which was made, uh, this is not directly related to animal protein, but then animals eat what grows in the ground, and the ground is made of soil. And the point was made that the quality of soil is an issue which really needs to be addressed, both in terms of its quality, in terms of its fertility, in terms of conservation, because, it, because what animals eat is what we eat as well. So therefore, the questions related to feed and feed safety also came into the picture. So overall, the, um, what the case was actually made, uh, and as I said, about partnership between the private sector and all other parties, and there were like a few ideas that are there to be taken up further in this. Yeah, thank you. That's a very good summary, very good summary indeed. Um, Regina, this entire conference event is fundamentally about malnutrition and hunger and uh, putting an end to that within the next decade. So I think it's uh, appropriate that you come in now and, and add your perspective, um, summarise what happened yesterday and, and give some comments from the position of a nutritionist uh, with regards to this topic of malnutrition and, and perhaps also uh, overnutrition. We touched on that briefly yesterday. That is also a significant issue in this country and around the world. So, Regina, over to you. Yeah, thank you. Um, good morning, everybody. I, um, I actually like to reflect on what we discussed as a group, and um, we had the breakout session which was titled Malnutrition. And um, when we came together as a group, uh, the, m the main importance was immediately given to stunting. And so, um, but of course you have to remember that SDG 2 is to end all form of malnutrition. So um, I made sure that um, wasting overweight and micronutrient deficiencies didn't fall off the discussion. 
while we were focusing on stunting. And we had a very lively discussion, and we were also uh, lucky because uh, in our group we had um, speakers and representatives who came forward with experiences that were very close to Jakarta, only two hours away. Well, one uh, a private sector was actually doing a project in Tengarang, which is very close. But we also had NTT and NTD uh, representatives, which of course could then talk about what's happening in the outer islands. And uh, those who know a bit about the statistics, uh, stunting is very uh, high in, in the outer islands. Um, malnutrition prevalence is actually pretty bad there, in particular stunting. So I, instead of giving maybe my own opinion, I would actually like to give the opinion and the experiences that we had in our discussion. And it, it was very interesting because, first of all, yes, we zoomed in into stunting. Um, and uh, one of the representatives um, from Flores actually pointed out, from Bupati, pointed out that there is a stigmatization on stunting which I thought was very interesting to hear. I didn't expect that to come forward like this, but basically since stunting is occurring in the richer segments of the population as well as in the poor, uh, poorer segments, there is sort of a, 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 a funny feeling when I have enough money but my child is stunted as well. So am I actually as poor as my poor uh, uh, um, friend or colleague or in the community. So there is a stigmatization going on and uh, um, we then discussed further about how to get rid of this and how to actually address it because you can only uh, address it once the standing problem is openly discussed and it's understood that actually it affects everybody so far in Indonesia. The difference is that of course if you have more purchasing power you can actually look for solutions. Whereas if you are poor, you have not a lot of solutions because you have limited um, abilities. So that was a very important point. And um, the other point that came out was about collaboration. Um, stunting is, a, is, is, a, is an issue that you need a lot of collaboration and you need a lot of different sectors that actually work together. You cannot only do it with one intervention. You cannot only do it with uh, one nutrition intervention. You need hygiene, you need wash, you need food, you need uh, agriculture, you need policy. So it's actually calling for, like uh, what you said, multiple stakeholder partnerships. Otherwise, you will not be able to do, to do anything. Um, the other point that came out was about um, a very, very um, nice point from the field, uh, from the Bupati representative from Flores, uh, and, and pointing out that we need champions to bring forward the issue about stunting. Because we started our discussion in, in the sense that I uh, provoked a little bit and asked, do you really understand what stunting is? Who knows what stunting really is? And, and then uh, it was uh, also a sort of an awakening that a lot of people actually do not really know what stunting is, even though we talk about stunting. Indonesia talks about stunting, and now you can even read it in the newspapers. But what is it really? And so um, we... Dina, can I just interject? Yes. Can you just give your definition of stunting to the audience? Well... To make sure... Yes. I mean, I mean, stunting is uh, both. It's an outcome and it's an indicator which we use. But stunting is a long-term suboptimal consumption of a diet. So that means it's, it's, it's the result of eating very long, over a long period of time, not the right food, not getting the right uh, essential micronutrients, not getting the right protein and everything, calories. It's, it's, it's a real combination. And the result is that you are impaired. You're having impaired growth. You're small. You know, you look like if you're five years old, but you're actually 10 years old. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, the, the important point is that it has a huge influence on your cognitive development yeah. because it affects on how your brain is, brain is also developing. So there are lots of factors, and that's bad stunting. And, and so what, what we were discussing and what came clearly out is that in this country, we need champions who really go around and talk about stunting and talk about what should be done. Um, and 
there was also the wish of having a campaign. Let's have a campaign because Indonesia has lots of campaigns, so we should also have a campaign really around stunting to bring that out. The other point that came was um, that we need knowledge center, um, and knowledge center in the sense that we need to have peer-to-peer -peer interactions, um, like, for example, uh, also the, the representative of Bupati uh, was asked to go and talk here at, in Jakarta with the national government about his, his activities doing to, against stunting. And so he's sort of playing like a champion. But we need to really make that more and then also come in with knowledge center. And we can also have, uh, we, we should learn how we used apps in other sectors and bring it into the standing issue. So um, that was very in interesting. We did not go into yet all the solutions, because that's for, for, for today. But we also had uh, discussions around uh, making sure that we can fortify some stables, bring that forward, and look into some of the, um, of the possibilities that are there. Um, and um, it was. The question then I asked, do you get enough information around stunting um, so that you know what's going on? And then, um, no, the answer was no, which was interesting. So I think even though there is a, a presidential uh, support to reduce stunting, I think in general the population would benefit to actually get more information around stunting and what can be done. Yes, yeah, so change begins with knowledge. And, and so how would you recommend we get this information, this knowledge, at scale to the field? We're talking about millions and millions of people. Is it technology? Is it a workforce of millions that goes out there uh, face to face? How, how can we do that? How can we get this fundamental knowledge to the place it needs to be? Is it an app? You mentioned an app. I think yeah. it's a combination, yeah. uh, but we should look into some apps because um, we can use this to either gather data or then to measure or to, to share. Um, and we have some sectors, you know, education uses a lot of apps and, and hygiene uses a lot of apps, so we, we, we should look into that. But we should also engage with the social media and yeah. the newspapers yeah. and, and, you know, just make a real, real big awareness campaign, I think, yeah. while also looking at the concrete solutions and strategies, because you still need nutritious food, which is affordable. And this is where all the environment and the economic constraints are coming in, and we need to work on that, and we need the private sector to engage, to make sure that private sector is there to help to make affordable, nutritious food. And this was another point that came out in the discussion. Uh, it seemed that there was really a lack of private sector engagement to particularly solve the problem around making nutritious food affordable. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I sometimes question whether the private sector will self-regulate. I mean, we talked yesterday about junk food and diets and overnutrition. Um, there's a conflict between profitability and selling donuts and selling packaged, high-processed foods to the marketplace. And I, you know, I come from the private sector, and I, I just, I, I'm a, a bit of a skeptic at the moment, um, particularly when it comes to this issue of uh, overnutrition. Um, so I don't know if there's anyone that represents Unilever here in the audience, or um, who would like to make comment, but that's my honest feeling. Um, having witnessed this discussion now for 30 years as well. Um, there's a conflict. There is a huge conflict, yes, yeah. but I think um, that's why we also pointed out if you want to address stunting, you have to address this in collaboration yeah. with different stakeholders. Industry itself cannot make nutritious food affordable like that. Yeah. They need incentives, they need the government behind, but they also need civil society who engages with them um, on doing this. So I, I, I think it's a real challenge. And when you look at the overweight, I mean, stunting is also, uh, your, you have a high probability that you will be overweight as well. So um, we really need to look for having alternatives yeah, and also, behavior yeah. change. Remember the plenary we had yesterday yeah. about consumer change, behavior change. It's yeah. a huge challenge. Behavior change is important, and, but I, I think in some ways public policy is even more important 
that, that some of these issues need to be regulated. You know, that, that you know, I go back to my time in New York City where the mayor came in and said, look, there is a reason this population, which is, you know, the richest city and the richest country in the world, is either hungry or obese. Mm. It's, it's <laughs> what they're eating. You know, so we need to regulate this because individuals without the access to education won't self-regulate, and, and certainly the corporations that are selling the, you know, the high sort of uh, um, calorie, shallow calorie foods won't self-regulate either. Okay, how are we doing for time? I think we've got five minutes. Well, I think we might wrap up at this point. Are there any questions from the audience that you would like to address either to a specific member of the panel or the panel in general? Um, and if there are not, are there any questions that fellow panelists would like to ask each other? Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, th thank you, uh, Tony. If I may, just uh, to add on to Stephen's yep. commendation or question to yep. perceive to be a coordinating minister, uh, you mentioned about the importance of uh, certification linking to uh, public policies. I think nowadays with ISPO, in Indonesia System of Palm Oil, um, it is, of course, crucial uh, to make it happen, but how can you help the government using their own instrument mm. to then uh, not only execute ISPO, but also getting, uh, let's say, support from different uh, stakeholders uh, to make it happen. What I can see now, the government itself, uh, regardless of the price now, because of the price of palm oil going down, but they do have what Stephen has mentioned the crude palm oil fund or CPO fund. Mm -hmm. So if, let's say, if farmers can get to the, that certification level, one of the key incentives that can pro be provided is the provisions of uh, fund for uh, replanting, for instance, for independent smallholders. This would then be, uh, in my view, uh, useful to uh, not only increase productivity of farmers, but also creating new business models uh, linking to the outgoers uh, in different provinces in, in Indonesia. Uh, one of the key issues, of course, uh, the challenge that the use of CPO funds is not only for replanting, but that's again the challenge with the government. Many challenges. Look, I think that um, one of the prerequisites for doing the work that you do is optimism. I mean, you have to get up feeling yep. optimistic because it can overwhelm. Um, Twitter, what, what gives you a sense of hope moving forward 10 years out from the sort of the deadline of, of delivering SDG 2, which is the focus for this conference? What gives you hope? Well, uh, it, it's clearly when you have um, people from various backgrounds and various professions attending events like these and actually putting forward their ideas, uh, that itself is a step forward. I mean, there is now in this world a great deal of awareness of a number of issues related not just to nutrition but also to sustainability, the necessary to come, you know, necessity to combat climate change, the necessity to have sustainable ways of farming. Um, what we are seeing now, for example, in other related issues, for instance, we have the fall RB worm infestation, which is a major pest of maize, which is now invading all across Asia. Now there is an approach to actually go in for integrated pest management and to sort of change the traditional way of doing business. So that itself is room for optimism. I mean, I wouldn't say, you know, 2030, everything is achievable, but certainly we have made big strides in changing our mindset that the only way we will actually survive beyond 2030 is if we bring, we bring this together. Okay, we've got two minutes. Uh, Stephen, uh, Regina, would you like to offer any final comments? Otherwise, we'll wrap up and go to the coffee break. Um, Stephen? I'm, I'm, I'm full of hope. Yeah. Um, that's why I come to work, actually. Yeah. Um, but I see the, uh, the disconnections and the lack of belief in some parties that, that, that the sustainable solutions can be achieved. And I think we need to catalyze this. I think um, we need to get some really well-placed thinkers um, to empower the government in a way that they perhaps don't feel empowered. We were discussing this in the rice session this morning. Um, to give them, I mean, the Minister of Agriculture has already expressed his view that 
the extension, the public extension services need to be upgraded and brought up to date. They are a huge workforce that could really facilitate a lot of change, both on the on both of your sectors as well as uh, the one I was talking about, and in terms of the health sector, really power the sort of behaviour change that that we're looking for in the malnutrition side to look at dietary change. So. Um, I think we need a bit of a re rethinking on the public sector role, but how they work with private sector is crucial because they, the one can't work without the other. No. Sure. Thank you, Steve. Maybe, maybe just the last. Uh, I yes. also would say um, I'm, I'm rather positive, even though uh, stunning could have been addressed already 20 years ago, but now there's really national buy-in. President is behind it. Um, what is needed, and this is a bit to resonate what Stephen said, is now we really have to get the solutions, because we have solutions, but you, you have to think about it, how to do it. And for this, you, you, you need to stimulate and you give, give uh, input to the government and to the different sectors. And the private sector need to be at the table. Absolutely. I mean, it, it may not feel like it, but there is progress, and, and we're moving in the right direction. Okay. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please thank uh, the panelists. I think that was a very, very insightful useful discussion. Now just uh, before we move off for a coffee break, um, after the coffee break at, what is it, it's uh, 11 a.m., we'll move back into the working groups. And just a reminder of the room, so the Stable Crops Orem Room on the second floor, uh, High Value Crops Hesse Room, which is on the third level, Animal Protein with Sridhar is back, I assume it's the same room, Stella room on the second floor, and then malnutrition with Regina, uh, Raka on the third floor. Um, they'll come back later on in the day and have a discussion around concrete targets, measurements, goals, objectives. So this morning's session was a high level uh, summary of the discussion. Now the objective is to come back with something a little more concrete that can feed into this national development uh, framework. So thank you indeed. Go and enjoy your coffee. Uh, stay away from the donuts, and uh, we'll see you after lunch. Okay. Stay away from the donuts. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>